Hello and welcome to another episode of CISO Tradecraft, the podcast that provides you with the information, knowledge, and wisdom to be a more effective cybersecurity leader. My name is G. Mark Hardy, and on today's show, we're going to be talking about 1% leadership with Andy Ellis. Now, if you haven't heard about the concept of 1% improvement, here's a quick idea. You don't have to make huge sweeping changes to improve. Now, imagine if you could get 1% better every day at something and do this for an entire year. Well, that's 365 days and you go, okay, fine, 1%, 1%, that's gonna be like 3.65%, right? No, because it compounds. And if you go ahead and open up your calculator and you take 1.01 and you raise it to the 365th power, you're gonna get 37.78. That's crazy. When you consider that compounding 1%, makes huge, huge improvements. Now, that's not twice as better or 10 times as better. That's almost 38 times better than the year before. Now, presumably, you might take off weekends and holidays, and you're not going to get that. But just the whole concept tells you that making these little gains on a regular basis are going to produce huge results. And that's the lesson that we're going to learn from Andy from his new book on 1% leadership. But before we get going, Let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Risk 360 is a cybersecurity technology and consulting firm that works with high growth technology firms to help leaders build, manage, and certify security, privacy, and compliance programs. They publish weekly thought leadership, webinars, and downloadable resources like budget and assessment templates. Go to risk360.com slant resources for more details. That's risk360.com slant resources. Okay, well, back here to our show. Andy, you're excited to bring you on board. You've been in the cyber game for quite some time, and you've even been inducted in the CSO Hall of Fame. Can you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got into cybersecurity? Thanks, G. Mark. I'm really excited to be here today. So I got into cybersecurity through the Air Force. In fact, it was a a sort of an entertaining day. I was in Luke Air Force Base in the middle of summer. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Luke, it's in Phoenix. And in the summer, you have days that the planes can't fly because the tarmac is too soft for them to land. And I was there because I wanted to be a weapon systems officer. I you know, did not have the eyesight to be a pilot, but I wanted to be a backseater. And I get this phone call in the, you know, the hotel room I'm staying in, you know, visiting officer's quarters, because as a cadet, that's where we got to stay. It was kind of cool. And it was this major at this base in South Carolina. And it sounded oddly like an interview, like totally uncalled. I had no idea what was going on. And the Air Force had just stood up its first information warfare squadron. And they had a by name request allocation. They could basically pick anybody in the Air Force and say, this person is working for us at their next assignment. And they said, we want every graduate in computer science coming out of MIT. And unfortunately that was me. I was the only person assessing that year. And so I get my commission, I go to South Carolina and I start doing information security. So that's where I started, you know, did that for you know, a few years. Once I got out, I went to Akamai and I was there for 21 years, built the security program, started by you know, hardening this massive deployed network, providing strategy and governance, at some point pivoting and saying, we could use these technologies for security solutions. And now Akamai just announced recently that their largest line of business is the security business. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, I know the, the, the by name request, I had one of those as well as an O, I guess just made O3, and it was to Fort Meade. And I didn't realize at the time just how special that was. Right. Uh, but when I got a call from Washington from my detailer, and the Navy you have detailers who run your careers, like, Lieutenant, what are you trying to do? He says, well, I want to go you know, to NSA. Why would you do that? Well, I want to do computer security. And here's a quote for the ages. The Navy has no need for computer security. You're going to go back out to sea. It's like, I've been at sea for five years. I got a shore tour coming up. And they made such a hassle about it in Washington. And they said, "Ah." so I went into the reserves and then I decided I'd do a security career that way. And kind of interesting because I look at a guy who was a year behind me, who also had five years at sea, who also put in for the orders. And, but he took them and he went there and he retired a couple of years ago. His name was Mike Rogers. (laughs) <laughs> and so it's one of those little butterfly effects in life. Right. You never know what opportunity is way, way, way ahead of you when you make your decision. So a lot of us aren't thinking 30, 35 years ahead. And there's really no way you could see that. There's no, you really can't. Can. 
I, I think you have to just set yourself up wherever you are. Like, what am I going to learn? Yeah. Like, I've always been interested in like, how do you take systems and make them better and different and find the edges? I used to work at Disneyland many, many years ago. And I was there, I did a costume inventory. And so we gave people their clothing. And this is the everybody in the park. So the ride attendants, the food service, and we went from a paper based inventory system to a mainframe. And like, I was one who sat there and I was like, God, we're typing in like to get from the first page to the second page, you have to hit like 17 of the exact same keystrokes for every single person. And I'm like, and there's four function buttons that don't do anything. I wonder if I could program a macro in. And so I literally did. And every time the machine rebooted, I'd have to go and like put the macros back in and everybody loved it. And at some point I get called in and the you know, supervisor's like, Yo, know, this is really great efficiency. We wish you would have asked for permission. Yeah, then no good deed goes unpunished, does exactly. it? Exactly. Yeah. Now, you've just come up with a, a new book called 1% Leadership, and it's got yep. a lot of you know, piece of short advice that cyber leaders can follow to get a little bit better at cyber. And one piece of advice that we really like that you shared, as we were talking earlier, is how you shorten the amount of time it takes to respond to vendors by using email signatures. Now, can you tell our listeners a little bit about this concept, because I think it highlights just how we can be 1% more efficient. Well, if, if you're somebody who looks like a buyer, could be a CISO, mm -hmm. could be a CEO, could be an operating partner. I happen to have all of those titles on LinkedIn. So I got a lot of vendor spam. And what happens is people will email you and it's, it, look, it's the lowest paid job in sales is the person who's sending you email, right? It's the business development rep. They're just trying to break in. And they've got some script probably in sales loft and they're just hammering you with things that you're seeing a million of. And it had gotten to the point at Akamai that I think I was getting like 50 a day and I just ignored them. And I would mm -hmm. make fun of it, like run into a CISO. And I'm like, God, I have this guy who just keeps replying to himself every single day. Like, I don't know if you saw my message. And I'm thinking, well, either I'm not seeing any of them, in which case, what are you saying that? Or I've seen all of them, in which case, why are you saying that? You're trying to make me feel guilty. It's clearly not going to work. And it was, it was actually Nick Selby. And Nick said to me, he said, well, why don't you just tell them no? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, because I don't want more email. And he's like, try it. See if they'll honor a no. So I said, okay, but I don't just want to say no. That feels rude. So how can I be, do something surprising and polite and friendly that's still a no? And so mm -hmm. I wrote this template and I said, you know, good day. I know you have a job to do, namely get a qualified first appointment, but I'm letting you know I'm not a lead for you. And then here's a Q&A of all of the questions I think you're about to have, and let me just answer them for you. And then I made it a signature file so that I could just click reply and change signature to what I called vendor rebuff. And in fact, if you Google vendor rebuff, but I misspelled rebuff, it's with only one F. But if you Google that, you will get the blog post that I put up, which has that template in it back from when I was at Akamai. I use different templates now and I'm still rewriting them because I have different ones based on you know, people trying to get me to invest. And I say, look, I have an investment thesis. You don't fit my investment thesis. Have a nice day. So your macros again. Yeah, it's By all about macros. Like yeah. how can I, as quickly as possible, and it gets them to go away. First of all, it reduces my long-term cost mm -hmm. because I reply and most of them go away. Sometimes I get an, a thank you. like. I get BDRs that are like, thank you. This is the nicest email I've ever received. And I'm thinking it was a template. Like I sent you a form message and it's the nicest thing you've ever gotten. We have a problem as an industry. <laughs> exactly. By the way, don't feel bad about spelling it. The referrer field is yep. also spelled wrong. If you that go is, back and you that's take a look. That's true. And so it's a, it's a, it's a tradition. I know. I feel now, like I should correct it, except there's enough people who have linked to it that I'm terrified to correct the spelling at this point. Well, yeah, you just create two links. You just haven't yeah. come to the same places. So you landed here and you can't spell. But I can. <laughs> so here it goes. But so anyway, you were talking about little life hacks. And the, the idea here is you get more efficient with things. And you don't have to be massive, huge projects, as you had indicated. Just something that allows you with a point and a click to deal with a problem, which then starts to go away by itself. And these are some great concepts. And I'd love to talk some more ideas about them. Mm -hmm. One of the concepts you have in your book is about don't be irreplaceable, be unclonable. What are we saying here? So we see this thing in a lot of organizations that you have a person that does some set of work that nobody else can do any of that work. And mm -hmm. so they're irreplaceable. And like you get terrified when they say, I just got engaged to be married. 
we literally had somebody like this. Like this was the person that when we had a problem that you wanted to solve with a weird integration of technology and process would build great systems, but he was then the person who would have to manage them. And he comes in one day and he's like, I just got engaged. We're getting married next year. And like the first thing his entire management chain thinks is, oh no, like he's going to disappear for a month. What happens? Right. And so the, the idea here is to say there's no individual task that only one person should be able to do. The unclonability is you should have people that have a, a set of skills that nobody else has that exact same set of skills, mm -hmm. right? So that if, if two people leave, you don't want to lose like 18 capabilities at once. You want to lose like the one or two things that they overlapped on. And it's the overlap that's key. And we go right. back to training, you know, like we're talking about military and the SEAL teams. And they go out there and do an operation, cross training going on because yes. there's no guarantee that everybody's going to be able to complete the mission. Right. And you don't say, oh, if this person goes down, everything they were doing falls on one person. No, it gets split across the whole team. Mm -hmm. And that's basically your idea. And now once you really embrace this idea, what you'll realize is this then applies to hiring. When somebody leaves, you don't try to replace them because you can't. Instead, find somebody who brings a set of skills and ability to learn that will complement your existing team the best. And they might be shaped like the person who just left, or they might be completely different. You might lose an engineer and replace them with a tech writer because that's going to be the value multiplier your organization needs. Right. And a lot of times, you know, for people who are new to the industry, they're thinking, well, I got to have all these buzzwords and things like that in my background. Really effectively, you're hiring for attitude, not necessarily for knowledge. Right. Somebody who loves to learn, who's got to lean forward, I'll make stuff happen. They'll go figure it out. As compared to somebody who says, well, I went to school for it and I passed, but the books are just gathering exactly. dust and they don't want to punch the puzzle. Exactly. And which kind of brings up the idea of the importance of personal improvement, because the idea that personal improvement is a prerequisite to leading professionally doesn't just pertain to operating at a technical level. It pertains also at the leadership level. So how did your idea about that come about? So it really has sort of two different axes. So one is about authentic leadership and one is about demonstrating the value of personal improvement in its own right, which is if you as a leader have stopped growing, even in your skills, then mm -hmm. the people are going to around you will look and say, oh, this person doesn't value development. So when I try to go do development, they're going to sabotage me. Like, even if you never say it, your actions do in fact you know, convince people around. It's like, oh, this person is totally happy with their job. But the, the more important thing here is as a leader, you're going to give a lot of advice to people. And if they look at you and say, wow, I have never seen you take this advice or any piece of advice, right? So if you say like wellness is important, everybody should take time off from work and you never take a day off of work. <laughs> right. You have just signaled to them that, no, you can, if you take days off of work, I'm totally going to punish you for it in the long run. You're not going to get the promotion. You're not going to get the opportunities. So every piece of advice you give to people, you should at least practice that. Some of them won't necessarily fit. It doesn't mean that you have to do everything, but it means you've got to try and you've got to figure out how you are going to develop. And I think I landed on this one. Colonel told me, actually, as a general told me this story from when he was a colonel. And I don't know how, what it was like in, in the Navy, but in the Air Force, apparently, as I was told, is that when you get promoted to general, you're actually personally told by another general. Yes. So there's a general who will fly around, who comes into your office that knows you and says, hey, by the way, you've just been selected to be a general. And then you're going to actually, like, when you become a general, you fly around and meet every other general in the Air Force. So they all know each other first name basis. And he's yeah, sitting they, in his what they call an all flag officers conference. And they announced okay. the promotions just before that. So you're told, go to Annapolis on this weekend. There you Quick go. Side okay. story. So a buddy of mine, he got, he picked up his star. They call, he got, he gets a call from yep. the chief of Navy reserve. Hey, congratulations. You are now an admiral. Be here this weekend. And he's like, but I'm a, a troop boy scout leader and my boy scouts are on a camp out that weekend and i'm the only adult i can't make the all flag officers <laughs> conference i've got a commitment to the boy scouts and and you'd think he I remember he told me he said i thought my career was over right then he went on promoted he actually took Excellent. over the abu Ghraib prison after the army had had the issues yep. there and my friend retired as a number two in the navy reserve I mean, because he basically 
said, hey, I know I need to be here, but I have a pre-existing commitment. And it was a, quite a valid one. It wasn't a barbecue. It was you're taking right. care of these kids. No, I, 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 and I love that he made space for that. And that's an mm-hmm. important thing. And, and in this story, the general telling the story, and he says, like, he was working late. His buddy comes in who'd, who'd made general like the year before, shows up, like walks into his, you know, squadron. And, you know, he's like 8 p.m. and he's the only one in the building. And the general sits down. And the first thing the general says, he says, where's the rest of the squadron? And the colonel's like, well, I sent, made sure they go. I make sure they go home at five o'clock. He's like, so you've been working for three hours after they left. And he's like, yeah. He says, you have like 200 people that work for you. If they had each worked for one minute longer, you could have gone home with them. And instead, all of them are stressed that they left the building before you did. A little 1% on each. Right. 1%. And as a leader, like everything you do is through your organization. The way that you change the world directly is much less effective than how you change the world through other people. And that, I think, is sort of the essence of leadership. And when... I used to do leadership training in the Navy in my prior role at the Center for Naval Leadership. We would go through and we would ask different characteristics. What do you believe a leader is? And we get the, the white butcher board paper and we'd be writing out with a Sharpie. And a lot of things would come out of there, but one that consistently came out time and time again was vision. Yep. And the difference really as a leader is you're trying to create a motivation for your people. And one of the dangers are is that some people, when they transition from a management role to a leadership role, still want to hold on to that attention to detail, right. and make sure all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and they've got to look excellent on paper for their opportunity going forward. And because they own all of that, they don't develop their lieutenants. Right. They, be, they become the people who say, well, I got to look, look great. And I, and I saw that with with new commanding officers in the Navy Reserve, where this promotion, the selection rate for command as a Navy commander in the reserves was about 6%. Yep. It's, you're better, you're easier to get your kid in Harvard than you are to get a command. So if you get one of these coveted commands, what do you want to do? You don't want to screw it up. And right. so what I had seen is these new COs basically turning into, hey, you know, don't turn that report in. I'm going to take care. And they, they try to do everything. It says, no, your job is to develop your people. And you know, I had had the privilege of had nine command tours and you get to the point where I know what will break and what won't break. So here, right. take this. And if, it, if you drop it and break it, what did you learn? Well, let's go exactly. fix it. And the next time, by the third time, they've got it. And then it builds up the ability to get things done. And so your comment about, hey, what are you telling your people and what are you doing is excellent because it's almost the idea that feedback should be not a a one-way mirror, it should be a window. It ought to work yep. both ways because sometimes we find out that our direct reports can give us ideas that we never thought of that help even ourselves. Have you seen that work well in the workplace? Oh, absolutely. So it's it's really important to recognize that whether you're giving or receiving feedback, mm-hmm. that it's impossible to eliminate the bias of self-reflection. That I look at something you do and the feedback that I give you is almost always going to be colored by me thinking, why would I have done the thing that G Mark just did? Mm -hmm. And you might hear that feedback and be like, that makes no sense to me. Like I recall at one point I had somebody who was a a peer in an organization who literally attempted to take half of my organization from me just through bureaucracy, like literally went to HR, said, here's all the people that are moving into my team, had never talked to me about it. And the way I find out is my finance partner calls me and asks if the budget was moving with them. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, like these seven people are moving over to this organization. I'm like, no, they're not. And we had one of these like peer feedback sessions. You like a leadership offsite with a group of people and they Mm -hmm. pair people up and say, give each other feedback. And this person says to me, you're an empire builder. And I'm literally sitting here listening to it. And I'm like, that is feedback you should be giving yourself. And so it clicked for me in that moment that he wasn't talking to me. He was talking to himself as if he also had my job. And of course, he had tried to empire build by taking my team. And how he would have responded to that was by sabotaging it and making sure there was no possible way that this work would ever move over. Mm -hmm. And so he saw what I did as being consistent with how he might act and gave me feedback about it. Whereas I'm sitting here and I'm like, that had nothing to do with what I was doing. Didn't you see like, I handed over seven people to a different organization the same year and got rid of a whole function. That's like not empire building. 
when you're giving feedback, pay attention to that. And when you're getting feedback, listen for that. That when somebody tells you you're doing something wrong, they're probably wrong about why. Mm -hmm. They might say you were a jerk and you did X. Well, ignore the you were a jerk part and just right. listen to the you did X and recognize that X was a problem. You know, it's interesting. I, I carry in my wallet a little thing that I got out of, you know, in addition to some you know, one-time emergency code, but a little thing that I got as a fortune cookie a few years ago said, advice comes in all forms. Some help you and some hurt you. Yes. And in a way, you have to consider that even if the advice is offered, it may be well-intentioned, but incorrect for you, or yep. it could be ill-intentioned as somebody's way of trying to sabotage you by trying to convince you to say, yeah, just go ahead and jump off that cliff. It'll, it'll be fine. Right. And, and things like that. And it's something that was, I kind of found entertaining in your book. You talk about whether you jump out of a plane or get pushed out. You still need a parachute. Can you tell us a little bit more about that concept? Yeah, so this is all about just being prepared for sudden changes in your environment. Mm -hmm. How many people have a plan to get laid off? Almost no one. But let's just be honest. If you're working for an employer right now, at some point, that relationship will end. You might retire. You might die. Like those are the, the outcomes you don't really have to plan as much for. But odds are, you know, especially economic turbulence, you're going to get the call that says, yeah, hey, we have to part ways. Do you have a plan for that day? So that when that happens, nobody on the outside understands whether you got laid off or you voluntarily left because you had a plan. And so you execute on your plan. It's, oh, hey, look, I got laid off. I've got you know, opportunities lined up. I already had a resume ready to go. You know, whatever it was, I had prepared for my next opportunity. Or even just inside your company, like, have you prepared for incidents to happen so that when the incident happens, like you've already got like pieces of a plan, you quickly put it together and everybody's like, how did you know this incident was going to happen? And you're like, I didn't know the incident was going to happen, but I was prepared for an incident. And you know, I'll give an example for COVID-19. Like this is starting to happen. We get the outbreak in Boston at the Biogen conference. And I immediately send my team home and I tell them all to stop at the supermarket on the way home, you know, pick up food, toiletries, you know, whatever they're going to need. Assume you're going to be home in your house for three weeks. And this is before we, people have even said two weeks to stop the spread. Right. Right. And so a lot of people are like, wow, Andy, like, how did you know this? And I'm like, because we simulated this for the avian flu when that was running around and we built a zombie apocalypse plan for slow moving zombies. And like, we did all these little pieces to, to say, what if, what if this happens? What does my parachute look like? So that when I find myself in that situation, I'm not trying to build a parachute from scratch. And that's wise. And I think we do that in the business world sometimes with tabletop exercises, with some of our strategic planning, where we just go through the saying, what if, what that, if then else, if then else. We had the same thing here is that in, I guess it was the second week of February, I just finished updating the disaster response plan yep. for the organization. And I remember the, oh, it said, hey, can you come up with a pandemic response plan just in case? And it was really just a global search and replace of disaster with pandemic. Exactly. And we ended up invoking it the following week and we operated for over 65 weeks remotely. And it worked because it was already there. We weren't panicking. We weren't scrambling, trying to get space up in the cloud or, or figuring out how to do access. And you're right, it's a bit of an insurance. And I always thought about life insurance as something you don't want to collect on because think about it, the agent is betting you're going to live. That's how he makes yep. his commission. And you're giving money to bet he's wrong. But in this case, we're looking for something that allows us to accept and then move forward on negative events, not because we're worried about how they caused or they didn't occur on our schedule, but our response is on our schedule. And we exactly. control that. We if you control and own what you have, you don't worry about other things. And more importantly, you don't waste energy. Oh my God, I'm outside an airplane. How could this happen? Like you can complain all you want. You've got 30,000 feet until you're dead. Yeah. And but then you hit the automatic stop, as we called it at jump school. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Let's hear a quick word from our sponsor. Are you ready to answer the question, are we protected? Introducing Prelude Detect. Prelude Detect is a production scale, continuous testing platform that gives organizations assurance that they're protected against the latest threats, that they've correctly prioritized their critical vulnerabilities, and 
their defensive controls work exactly as expected. And if not, Prelude's integrations with defensive controls such as CrowdStrike create an auto-hardening defense. Get started for free or request a demo at www.preludesecurity.com. That's preludesecurity.com. Hey, well, back here to our show, but that, it's kind of related to the idea of something, the concept you talked about, the Museum of Past Grievances. And you don't want to spend any time visiting that because in our culture, we have people who like to complain and say, well, I got it bad. Well, I have it worse. Well, how bad? How do we change that mentality, which really is sort of a destructive approach? Yeah. So I think it starts almost at the personal level. Like you have grievances against people in your life. You know, maybe you have the relative who gives you gifts that you don't appreciate, but you don't feel like you can dispose of them. Why mm -hmm. not dispose of them? Because every time you see, like you have a stack of books you're never going to read because you have somebody who thinks this is the type of book you'll read. Like they keep sending you these leadership books. And you're like, I'm never going to read them. Fine, pass them, give them to somebody else. But every time you walk past something that reminds you of an unpleasant interaction you had, you're wasting your energy because you think about the interaction. It creates negativity. So get rid of it. Like it's, it's not saying that you have to forgive the person and eliminate the grievance, but don't curate this museum of reasons to burn and waste your energy on people who don't matter that much to you anymore or situations that don't. Like if you leave an employer and you have a ton of branded gear and you're like, well, I'm not going to wear this, then take it out of your closet. Like don't just keep you know, sorting your clothing around this logo. If you're uninterested in wearing the logo, dispose of it. And there's probably people who could use it at a local, you know, collection, homeless shelter exactly. or, or something like that. Or, or colleagues who are still there. You can be like, hey, I've got a bunch of clothes. Anybody want them? Maybe yeah. they'll be, maybe you went to all the conferences. So you have all the swag and you have people who never got a piece of swag. So pass it mm -hmm. out. That's a very good idea. Now, another thought we have is that CISOs, well, we, we can't know everything. We have to trust our people and we trust that they're going to give us good advice. And and you talk about this when you say we need to create safety to let people warn us, if you will, of danger. What are some good ways that we can create opportunities for sharing information between, let's say, developers and cyber professionals so we get on the right page? So I think we have to get out of the binary mentality of either this is perfect or it is completely dangerous. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what happens is we get into these conversations and you say, well, this is a risk. And someone says, well, is that a showstopper? And like, you need to step back from that conversation because nothing is really a showstopper. Okay. There's a few things that are, but in general, most of what we're doing are not going to completely stop something, but it's a trap question. What you want to do is create a safe place for people to have a conversation about what the risks are to create risk awareness and to let people then come up with small modifications. It's like, oh, we're mm -hmm. rolling this system out. It has this thing that's unsafe. Well, maybe if we tweaked this one thing or turned off this feature, then we'd be fine. And we could do more mitigation later. It's not about, you know, stop it versus let it go and let it stay out there forever. So that's the danger is that if you are the chicken little whose job is to show up and say, oh my God, you can't do this because X, like nobody's ever actually going to listen to you. Mm -hmm. And so the dangers that you get into are ones that are fully predictable. Because you had somebody who was pointing out the dangers, but you made them say that dangers were either catastrophic or unimportant. And so you never actually fixed the things that mattered, but were not catastrophic until they happened. Yeah. So one of the concepts you talk about is practicing the future, if you will. To, you can face adversity with a little bit more grace. And that's, yep. let's just anticipate someone's going to do something bad. They click on a phishing email, it gets past them, they got past their technical filters, and somebody goes ahead and launches something anyway. So what's this concept of practicing the future to face yep. adversity? How does that work? So you take that unpleasant situation and you say, well, what are we going to do? What am I going to do? You know, whether it's I'm, uh, I'm the one who clicked the link. Okay, well, what do I do next? Oh my God, like the first time you go through this, you're terrified, your heart starts racing, I'm going to get fired, whatever. Walk yourself through, well, what does it really look like? And then keep doing this until, first of all, it, there's no emotion mm -hmm. involved. You're just running a script. You've practiced this. And at the end of the day, the only thing you can control is yourself and your own affect. And you basically want to say, I'm proud of how I acted. 
So it's like, okay, you click the link. Well, what I'm supposed to do is send mail to phishing or whomever that says, hey, I clicked the link. We got to go solve this problem now. And if it turns out they're going to fire me, fine, they're going to fire me. But if I don't tell them they're still going to fire me, except now they're the firing me. Lot worse. <laughs> right. They're firing me not for clicking the link, but for not telling them. And I'm not proud of that. I'd be like, look, if you want to fire me because I clicked a phishing link, I have no problem with that. Like that is not on me. That's on you. If you fire me because I lied about it, that's on me. And I didn't act with grace in the moment. I think one of the things I've tried to do in environments is to create an environment of no fear. Yep. Where I get someone who will contact me, hey, G Mark, I think I just clicked on something. Okay, great. Let's go. Let's go look at it. Right. And let's go fix it. And someone can say, hey, I screwed up. But you know what? There's no little secret file in HR. There's nobody keeping tabs. And when they know that, when they know that you're there to help out, then you're able to stop a lot of these potential lateral movements in their tracks. They mm -hmm. might attacker might get a foothold, but then that's it. And it doesn't go any further because you're able to respond right away. And I think that culture becomes very, very important. And I've had people who came through my classes where the guy said, you know, we got a VP, they had some phishing. He said that if anybody gets caught clicking on one of our test phishing emails, we're going to fire them. Yeah, they brought in one of the things like, no, you no. do not want to create a culture of fear because what's going to happen is, all right, great. I'm not going to open any email today until I get a phone call from the boss saying, hey, where is this project? And then right. you create a passive aggressive environment. And, and we don't want that. We want to be able to have people feel that they're empowered to get the job done. But security is there to protect them, not right. to restrict. And, and the reality is the fact that phishing is a problem is because we have not done our job at securing our email infrastructure and our client infrastructure. It, is, it has nothing to do with the human. The problem is everything around the human and the human is stuck as the last line of defense where there's basically no effective defenses in front of them. Andy, another thing that a lot of new leaders struggle with is delegation. And you make the comment that delegated work won't happen the way you would do it, but it will get done. So any good stories for good or bad about how that's played out and what you've seen? So I think this happens a lot. The first time you delegate something, what comes back is awful. You're like, how did this person possibly think this was what I asked for? And what you probably have to start to learn is that you didn't actually ask for what you wanted. You asked for some amount of energy to get spent. So you were, you delegated effort, not output. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the real secret to success in delegation is you say, here is the outcome that I want. And then if you need me to tell you some of the ways of how to do it, I can mentor you on that. But most people, when they do it badly, they start telling how and everything they don't perfectly specify becomes an error. And the reality and is, it's like what matters, get what matters done. And if 80% of it is done differently, you don't care because it got done. Mm -hmm. Right. And so think about like, for me, as I, I delegated so much, like we had to raise architects, we hired in interns and we developed them into architects over four years. And I got a lot of credit for building an amazing program to mentor and develop these architects. I had nothing to do with it other than saying, I want the program to exist. And what is important to me is that we will take people for their first job in the company and often their first job right out of college or through an insertion program. And after some number of years, they are credible system architects. And my team went and built an amazing program for me. Yeah. And I, I think it was Patton who said, don't tell people how to do something, tell them what needs to be done and they'll surprise you with their ingenuity. Right. And I, th I think that's the thing on, on delegation is also, there's a difference between delegating and dumping. And yes. you know, people new in a management role may do the dumping. Like they have this unpleasant task. Oh, we've got to fill this thing out. It's due by five o'clock Friday night. I don't want to do it. All right, Andy, get this thing done. Go finish it up and, and have it on right. my desk by five. With no sense of, here are the tools you need. Let me empower you to be successful. Let me act as a feedback loop to give you, hey, take some initiative. But if you get stuck or you're not so sure, ask me and then we'll work this out. But what I'm asking you to do is take ownership of it and then produce a result. And it might need some, probably will definitely need a little bit of editing at the back end. But the point is you're developing your people, they're learning and right. the delegation process. And when I alluded to that earlier, on the new commanding officers who were afraid to delegate because they were afraid to have anything less than perfect output. 
And, and they were thinking that's the way they're going to get a command again. And I'm thinking, this is how you're not going to get a command right. again. Because right. well, I want we'll get to get you a command you. is hey. taking yeah. advantage of your people. Yeah. And, and, and which I'm seeing is that, you know, allow some people to fail. Think about how we walk. You didn't say, okay, you can't start walking until you get it perfectly. Uh, you can't fly that aircraft until you're already ready to go. As a student pilot, I'm sure I did a lot of dumb things when I was learning, but once I figured out what I'm doing, but if I had to start out that way, there's no way any of us would have started. So it's a matter of letting go of your insecurities as a leader about the outcome. Yep. And you don't want to delegate something that is going to necessarily result in the success or failure of the whole organization. Some things you have to own. Right. But and you have to of- sometimes own that output. Like imagine you have to put together a board report. You mm-hmm. might delegate parts of it or even the whole thing to your staff. Right. But you don't show up in front of the board not having looked at the report. Exactly. You, 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 it's, it's the worst thing to have when, and I've, I've had people do that. I said, well, what do you mean about this? I'm blame, let me take a look. Said, Wait, it's okay that you didn't write it, but if you didn't review it before you right. got you didn't here, review it, you didn't have pick it apart and understand what questions were going to come your way. That's mm-hmm. a problem. Exactly. Let me jump over to a different area, which has been, I think a lot of people's agenda these days, and that's about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's a challenge for some of us in leaders and that we're trying to go ahead and make sure that we do this effectively and correctly. But you had suggested in your book that inclusion is really about reducing the energy cost that somebody has to pay just to exist in some space. And that's kind of a novel concept. Any tips that you can offer to our listeners and to help Absol- them out in that regard? Absolutely. And for me, inclusion is the, the start and the stop of DEI programs. Mm-hmm. Is- Usually when we talk about diversity and equity, we're talking about ways to measure the lack of inclusion, right? If you have an organization with no women, your problem is not diversity. Your problem is almost certainly that you were excluding women in one fashion or another. And that might just be you refuse to hire them. You're blatantly sexist. Fine. Let's go solve that. But once women come into your space, you know, are you making them pay costs that they're not willing to pay? You know, so think about what are your work hours, right? If you have working moms, you know, because moms often bear the burden of dealing with the kids. You know, if you're lucky, your dads are doing it too. But they're going to have constraints on their day. Somebody has to get the kids to school and pick them up. And so if you say, well, you have to be here at 730 for a meeting and you have to stay until 5 p.m. for meetings, then you have just told parents that they're not welcome in the space. And they're going to pay this energy cost whenever you send a meeting invite. Oh, can I afford to say no? Can I afford to decline it? And so every time somebody has to sort of challenge themselves to say, can I afford to pick this fight? You know, I'll, look, I'll give an example. I was just invited to keynote at a conference next year, right? And you should hear that and be like, oh, that's amazing. The conference is scheduled over one of the Chagim, one of the Jewish holidays that's a, like, you don't work on this day and you, sh- you go to shul and you daven. And like, this is when the conference is scheduled for. Now, this is such a norm in the conference industry that if I get invited, before I check to see if I'm available, I go check the Jewish calendar. Because apparently conference organizers don't bother to. Like, mm-hmm. That's an energy cost I pay to exist in the conference space. Now, I'm willing to pay it. But when I have a conference that does it, it tells me that's a space I have to be a little more careful about. Or I have dietary restrictions. And you know, there are some conferences that I send them my dietary restrictions and I get back this sort of very lovely note about what they're going to do to make sure I can eat. And I'm like, yes, you get it. I don't have to worry about eating for two days. And others, I'll get like this weird answer like, well, you know, great. We'll, you know, we'll have, we'll have some vegetarian meals. And I'm like, my thing said no dairy. So when you say vegetarian, I now know that I have to be prepared to eat, not in the conference venue, because you might mm-hmm. not have food for me. Well, that's energy that I am spending to be at your conference that produces zero value for the conference. And so whenever somebody spends energy to be in your workplace that doesn't produce value, that's a waste. That's a bad leadership. So how do you make it that somebody feels welcome no matter what they're doing? And sometimes that does mean you have to put your thumb on a scale and say, look, we need to do representation and make sure that our interview panels contain diverse voices so that people look and say, oh, when I show up to, to work, it's not all going to be white men. But then you'd better make sure that that energy cost 
that you know the first woman you hire is going to pay by having to do every interview that you've put that in her job description that when you record her performance she's going to have less output than the men around her simply because you took 25% of her time to do hiring and everybody else only spent 5%. And that works in organizations too. I remember in the Navy, I sat on a number of promotion boards and selection boards, 12 of them actually. Yep. And what would happen is some records would be annotated when officers were up for promotion as a minority. And it wasn't to flag the fact that this person was black or brown or white or whatever. It was to point out one important thing is that early on in their careers, the Navy to try to go ahead and get a more representative culture would say, hey, you're a black officer. And instead of going on to this career enhancing duty, we're going to put you in recruiting duty right. because we want kids to see somebody who looks like them in a position of success. And so what the whole notation there wasn't to say, hey, wow, if you happen to be a bigot or whatever, this is your chance to use it right. because hopefully that all got screened out. But it was designed to say when you try to weigh two careers and you say, well, this person's a little bit light on this experience. Oh, that's why they were in recruiting right. duty. Right. It wasn't that they them, chose to do it. It's because we chose them right. to do it. You give them full credit as if they were out there on a career enhancing war fighting tour. Yep. And so by doing that, it was a careful means of ensuring that we're going to disrupt things a little bit as we go, but we're going to try to make it right in the long right. run. And I think the challenge is, is that most people either just try to disrupt things a little bit or they try to make it right, but they, they don't know how to do it. So they say things like, well, we're going to have a career enhancing opportunity that is only available to, you know, our black members. Mm -hmm. And now people look at that and they say, well, that that's probably not right. And there's some good evidence that these aren't actually as helpful as you think they are. But if you tie the two together to say, we know we incurred a cost and we're going to pay that energy back for you, that works wonderfully. And, and, and so, yeah, there's some wisdom, and I, I was rather impressed when I saw how that actually all worked out. Now, you have a concept also in your book you mentioned about don't borrow evil where it wasn't yes. intended. What do you mean by that? So it's funny, I actually just you know, talked about this in a newsletter I put out. I said, there's no, no such thing as a microaggression. Either it's an aggression or it's micro, but there, there's, there's not this combination. All too often when somebody does something that hurts us mm -hmm. in some way, we assume ill intent. And I'm not saying you have to assume good intent. I'm just saying the moment that you assume ill intent, that you say that they're a villain, you have become a bigger part of the problem. You have escalated it. Now, it might be that they're a villain, but if you assumed it, you borrowed this evil, then you're creating an escalatory problem. Like, let's take the example of, you know, this, this conference that's scheduled over a holiday. I could have said, oh my God, this is a microaggression. And they're going to say, aggression implies intent. I didn't try to do this. I wasn't intentionally being anti-Semitic. And they're right. They weren't. And so when you borrow evil, you, you create the story in which the other person's a villain. And when somebody is a villain, it justifies you doing evil things to them. Well, now you have become the villain. And this is hard. Like, it's really easy to be like, look, there's, there's a million people out there who are doing things that are negative. Why do I have to be the one to, take the, to have that serene moment? and not escalate when clearly they're blindly escalating. And the answer is, if you want to be a great leader, that's part of the price you pay, which is you have to swallow that emotion and say, look, it is possible this didn't have ill intent. Like, I'm not going to say it's possible it was from good intent. Possible, didn't have ill intent. You were just ignorant. You don't understand how to do this. And so I can decide. I can just move on and say, fine, whatever. I'm not going to do this. Or I can say something. But when I say something, if I'm trying to affect change, if I tell you you're a jerk and I need you to change, you're unlikely to change. And some good insights. And as we're getting close to the end of the show here, there's a couple of things that I wanted to make sure that we mentioned. And one was the idea of creating powerful questions to build a rapport with business leaders. And yep. three of the questions you had that I, I liked, and you'd said that when you meet with executive peers, we should ask them these three questions. Number one. What is the stupidest risk that we're not taking care of that no one has dealt with? Yep. Number two, what is the dumbest security control that gets in your way? And then number three, what is something that you wish we did better in security? Can you tell us how we can use these type of questions to solve things better as a CISO? 
So in two ways, one is if you walk into a new environment, like rather than trying to, from whole cloth, figure out what the problems are, ask the people around you. And here's the secret. There's no such thing as a security professional. Like we like to pretend that we are like cooler and we're more knowledgeable, but everybody is a security professional. Every person you interact with who interacts with security has opinions. Sometimes they're misguided. Sometimes they only see part of it, but they know more about the risks that you face in your new organization than you do because they've been there. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you're just educating yourself. Like this is the shortcut. They'll walk in and they'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe that I have to log in seven times a day with MFA. Like you need to hear that because your team probably won't tell you unless you ask very careful questions about how the MFA got implemented. And you're like, wait, why are we like, this makes no sense. And our users hate us. Now, here's the important piece about that, which is when you act on what they tell you, you instantly earn political capital. Like they're going to give you low hanging fruit. And more importantly, by delivering the things they asked you to do, they owe you. Like in their head, they're like, oh my God, this person has my back. They're an ally to the business. And you'll have this reputation as being business focused. And so you ask the questions both to learn, but also to build the ability to get stuff done. Because some of the things you will need to change, nobody actually wants to go through it. Like they recognize it has to happen, but it's going to be this two-year project. It's a lot of work. And they're like, well, if we delayed it by three months, what does it matter? Like it's, it's a two-year project. Like three months now is three months in two years. So, so why can't we delay it? That's why you want to deliver on things that they really want. So that when you come back asking for something important, they're on your side. And there's some very good insight on that. Andy, we're getting close to the end here, but I want our listeners to remind you to pick up that 1% leadership book. You can get it on Amazon. It's available on Audible. And I know you'd probably appreciate seeing our community be about 37 times better. Absolutely. A year from now as they are now. Any last thoughts that you'd have that you'd like to leave us with? So I think the most important thing for any leader, and whether it's a security leader or you're going to be doing something else, is recognizing that your entire job is to stop hurting your team. Most leaders hurt their teams. Most organizations hurt their teams. This actually makes it really easy. You're not trying to take great and make it perfect. You're trying to make take bad all the ways in which we're taking the energy of our teams and wasting it and get from bad to decent. And it's sad in one sense that I say that and I'm like, people will think you're an amazing leader when you're just a basic, decent human being, but they will. And so find those opportunities. They are all over your environment to get 1% better in any number of different ways. Now, what's the best way if somebody want to get in touch with you, if, if only to go ahead and get one of your signature line responses to say, <laughs> go take a hike? Yeah. Is, so the you easiest like way to, to touch with you? Yeah. Easiest way to find me is I'm all over social media. I am CSO Andy, whether that's Twitter or LinkedIn or Instagram or just about anywhere. That's probably the easiest way to find me is just search CSO Andy. My personal website is CSOandy.com, which is where I curate my past archive of mm -hmm. everything I've ever written and every talk I've ever given. Um, and you can find me professionally at duha.co, the Colombian email domain name to, to can you spell that, that out, please. D U H A dot C O. And that's my consulting business. So if you're interested in having me come speak to your organization or come to a book signing, you know, you can reach out to me there. Well, that would be great. Hey, Andy, thank you very much for being part of our show and to our listeners. Thank you for listening to CISO Tradecraft or watching us on YouTube. If you don't already do so, please subscribe to us on YouTube. If you're listening to us in your podcast channel, uh, please go ahead and give us a thumbs up or something like that. So that helps other people find us. And don't forget on LinkedIn, we have a steady stream of what we think is high signal to noise ratio, excellent content for you that goes beyond just these podcasts. So thank you very much for listening or watching. And until the next time, stay safe out there.